You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling up business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And our guest today is David Russell. And David is a consultant and an author. We're going to talk about his background as being an expert in the category of hiring and helping companies find good talent, recruit good talent, retain good talent. And we're going to talk a little bit about his books. And we're going to talk about his podcast, Manage to Win. So a whole bunch of things in here. I'm excited for this. Um, For service-based companies, talent is a huge issue. It's It's a huge issue for any company, but specifically talent in service companies is a critical factor. So I think we're going to learn a lot. I'm excited for the conversation. David, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Bruce. I'm really honored to be here. It's great. Yeah. So let's kind of go back and and get a sense of your professional background. How did you get into the talent space? What inspired you? Give us a sense of your trajectory and and kind of professional experience. Well, I have, uh, maybe like yourself, I I have been working from a young age since 16 years old. So I got 46 years business experience. (laughs) But as far as getting into the talent, I I think what happened was, you know, I had leadership aptitude, Mm -hmm. but I didn't really have any skills. Yeah. And unfortunately, it took me an extremely long time to figure that out into my mid 40s. Yeah. So basically, at at the tail end of the dot com craze, I went to and convinced the guy at HP, Carly Fiorina had given this guy, you know, it worked out to be about $650 million to go throw at dot coms at the wrong time at the end of the craze. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, got a $10 million commitment from him, started this business. Then a year later, they yanked the funding. They didn't tell us, but they were closing the fund. Yeah. And then I wanted to uh, keep it going, which was very foolish. And I had a guy walk through the door who said, hey, I can solve all of your problems. I can make this work. And because he said what I wanted him to, to say, mm-hmm. you know, I hired him. And, you know, he came in as my partner and we went down this road. And a year and a half later, we went from dot com to dot bomb. Yeah. And that left me out of work. And the only job I could find in tail end of 2002, which was a tough job market, mm-hmm. was become a VP of sales at a company called Knowledge Point that was one of the early pioneers of doing online employee performance reviews and setting and tracking goals. Yeah, now I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. And within about 30 days, I realized this thing about aptitude versus skill when it came to leadership. Yeah. And literally, I was on a, a business trip, you know, had had a moment there where I felt, hey, got kind of a message that, hey, you got to help people avoid your mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's not have other people have the same problem. Yeah. That's right. It wasn't, hey, you're so brilliant. Go help people, you know. <laughs> um, it was go help people avoid your mistakes. Literally, it was a clear message. Uh, that's funny. So I started investigating, you know, what are the systems out there for leadership? I mean, a true system, not an idea for mm-hmm. this particular piece or that piece. Yeah. And that was, you know, early 2003. And since that time, now about 16 years later, that's what I've really devoted my life to is focusing on leadership systems and systems to reinforce a strong company culture. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that aptitude versus skills kind of difference. I mean, I guess, why do you think, I guess, why do you think that is? Why do you, why do you think people fail to kind of see the difference between those things or, or get caught into a sense of, oh, I think I'm a great leader or I, I must be a great leader because I know all these things. Why, like, what does this happen? Like, what, what is the dynamics there? Well, I think, I think part of it is you have skills in a certain area. And so you, you gain some confidence in that area. Uh, it could be technical, it can be sales, it can be operations, finance, whatever it is. Yeah. And then the other thing is that you have a certain amount of drive. So, you know, you, you see this often in, in uh, sports where 
someone will rise to the top on a sports team. Someone will be the captain of a sports team. But they're not necessarily, you know, a leader. And they really haven't been trained in that. But going back to the entrepreneurial area, you have a skill, you have some drive. And so, you know, quite frankly, you're the person that drives things. I mean, as a kid, if I didn't make mm -hmm. the call on Sundays to, to organize my buddies to go play football, we didn't play football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you have some leadership attributes but one of the major problems is we don't, and I, I think uh, you and I talked about this on, um, yeah. or maybe that was with David Sherman uh, recently, mm -hmm. last this week, uh, two days ago, I talked with him. It's not taught. It's not taught in school. You yeah. know, you, you think about the what I call the four management disciplines, how you hire, manage, develop, and retain people. You can transfer that into life, whether you're on an athletic team, in a band, mm -hmm. in the chess club, whether you're in a relationship, you have a family. These leadership skills transfer totally across your entire life. They're not just work skills. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're not and taught. Yeah, exactly. I, and yeah, I don't remember a course <laughs> in college around, you know, how to recruit, <laughs> how to recruit talent yeah. into your into your team or your organization. And you don't need to be a business owner. I mean, this is basically any any business endeavor initiative where you know, it's more than just you grinding away on a computer is going to be about how do you assemble the right team? How do you recruit the right people onto your project? And those are skills and, and they're not taught. Well, that's right. And you think about that, that piece of recruiting or hiring. If you really learn how to do that well and you taught people how to do that well in high school, reinforced it in college, <laughs> and you also taught them how to work together as a team, yeah. effectively how to manage conflict, how to set expectations, you know, all these different things. I don't know. You might see the divorce rate. Yeah, I was just going to say, you put marriage too. counseling out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, I mean, you know, think about it. If we actually understood this hiring piece yeah. of when we were out, you know, seeking that, that spouse that we want to live with the rest of our lives, yeah. we'd probably make some, at least some of us would make different choices. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one. So when, in terms of the kind of recruiting process or, or, or finding talent, selecting talent, I guess, how do you, how do you figure out what talent you want or you need? Because I think that's always, or at least that's part of the problem, which is knowing what to look for. So how do you recommend or how do you advise folks on kind of assessing their talent needs and, you know, what talent strategy they should be using? You know, that's a big question and it's a good one. And we're actually updating our whole hire the best system right now. I do a lot of hiring every week. I do interviews with people for clients and, Defining what you need, we use a tool that we call an employee strategic plan. Ooh, I like it. Um, it's, it's basically a business plan for an employee's success. It's like a job description on steroids. Yeah. And it's a good starting point because you have the job description type stuff of skills and qualifications and duties and responsibilities and the formal work-related competencies for the role. Mm -hmm. They're really a great tool because – the, what we do is in the, in the duties and responsibilities, we don't just put a laundry list, which is what you typically see in a job description, right? Yeah, you exactly. see everything anywhere from five <laughs> things to 40, Yeah. right? Just a bulleted list. Uh, let's talk about bullet number 33. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put those in three categories typically um, so that, you know, and we make them scannable because people don't want to read these things. They want to scan. Mm -hmm. The work-related competencies are limited to six to 10, so we don't get carried away on those. Mm -hmm. I've had clients go, oh, these are great. I want to put 20 of these in. <laughs> no, no, you can't do that. Prior to us. But keep in mind, that's the traditional job description stuff, and it's static. It's basically dead. So people look at that stuff once, and it goes in a file, and they never look at it again. Yeah. So we have it in the plan. The living, breathing pieces of the plan are, first of all, we have what we call targets, EOS calls them rocks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can call them whatever you want. They're goals. Yep. So we have three, three sets of goals. We have everybody in the organization, starting with the organization itself, has financial objectives, client experience objectives, and professional development objectives. Okay. And we have a, a method to write those. You, um, you don't have more than five for the year in, mm -hmm. in each category. Because if you get the high level ones done, it'll carry the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Written in a clear, measurable format. That's our the target format we use, it's actually an acronym. The first T is preposition two, the A is action verb, the R G is relevant goal, the E is effective measurement, and the T is time bound. Got I don't it. know about your experience, Bruce, but 
I'm amazed at how many people don't set deadlines on on goals. Yeah, I, well, it, certainly, you know, a date is what drives action, right? So without a date, there's really no sense of, well, what is my urgency around this? What do I need to do for a second? How quickly do I need to do them? So yeah, I would agree. I, 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 I like you know, sort of that sort of measurable and time bound are kind of my two criteria. Like, yeah, you can set smart goals, but I really just want empty goals. <laughs> and yeah, that's you know, right. all the other things are, you know, they're, they're nice and they, they should be in there somewhere. But at the end of the day, if I don't see an M and T and then we can't really go much farther. So I would agree. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, even very skilled people, I, I was hired by uh, the Microsoft Dynamics group to work with their president's club members for two years. They had about a hundred members each year. And a member of the group called me or, or emailed me one day said, Hey, we just put together a new goal for our team. We're really excited about what do you think? Yeah. And it was something like, we are going to provide our resellers with the most incredible experience ever. <laughs> I love it. And you know, it, it sounds great, right? Yeah. But it doesn't have your M and T. <laughs> exactly. It's just not there. So she didn't like my response. Uh, um, anyway, so so the plan, the most living, breathing part of the plan are those goals. Yeah. So we actually recommend you've got the plan. And by the way, when someone is in the role, we recommend they write the goals. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Yeah, right. And, and you know why it's, you know, they're going to own it more if they yep. at least draft it. Commitment. Yeah. So to me, but yeah. so I think the I, I love the idea that you start with sort of the tool that you're going to use the man you're going to use to manage the role when you go out to actually do the recruiting process i mean i think that you touched on the one thing which i see a lot which is you know you list you know 87 different things you want this person to be able to do or or you know skills or capabilities right so you're so yeah. extensive that either you're looking for a unicorn or you're 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 spending so much time trying to get into specific kind of capabilities that you're not really focusing on the bigger picture or you're knocking a bunch of people out. How do you deal with the difference between kind of capabilities versus experience or certification or education? So the difference between, you know, the ability, the demonstrated ability to do something versus, you know, years of experience or, you know, having a certain certification in a certain area or with a certain program or, you know, technology or something. How do how what's your take on how how you what do you use and what do you suggest people include in terms of their recruiting criteria for that? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, by the way, uh, the employee strategic plan also has two other living breathing parts that are important. One is behavioral expectations that are individualized between the manager and the the employee. What's an example? So the of, employee says, here's yeah. what I want from you, manager, to be the best manager I've ever had. Oh, okay. Interesting. And the so manager two does the same with the employee. So a two-way two -way agreement in terms of this is how I'd like to be managed and this is this is how I'd like you to perform. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's it's really an important tool because it removes assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you, you avoid some conflict by having that discussion up front. And then the last piece is we, we asked the employee to define what do you want to learn next year and the year after? Because I never want to lose an employee because they felt they didn't have an opportunity to grow. Mm. And yeah. so, by the way, and, and the strategic plans are great to use as part of the interview process at the, but, you know, that can be a separate discussion. And so your, your question, basically what you're saying is, do you look for somebody with experience or do you look with someone with the aptitude? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, my answer is it depends. <laughs> and it depends okay. on what? <laughs> so my reply depends, is depends on what? <laughs> it depends on you Okay. and your systems. So if you have the ability to hire less experienced people, but they are naturally superstars and you know, by their aptitude, this is somebody I want on my team and they're learners then hire the young people. Yeah. If you them. don't have that capability, then you have to hire the more experienced people. And, you know, that's more expensive. And those people come with their own baggage. We all have our own baggage. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, the habits, the good habits and the bad habits of the more experienced people are more ingrained and they're more difficult to change. Yeah. So you have to be very careful in the interview process to make certain that the person is not a great actor, but they're actually can do what you want to do and behave the way you want them to behave. 
Yeah. So how do you figure that out in an interview? I mean, I think that's always the, the uh, kind of the flippant saying I have around this is, you know, that the only thing interviewing does is tell you how well someone can interview. <laughs> you know, so how do, you, how do you get beyond, uh, you know, just that surface layer? You know, I spend an hour, two hours with somebody, you know, I ask them a bunch of questions. They give me canned responses. Like, how do I break through that? Okay. So anybody that listens to this podcast, I'm going to give them a million dollars right now. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to give you a million dollars right now because I'm going to answer your question. There are a lot of pieces to the puzzle mm -hmm. in interviewing and we, we go through that in our system, mm -hmm. but I'll give you the one make it or break it thing that will, will save you a million dollars over the next 10 to 20 years okay. if you do a reasonable amount of hiring. All right. And that is you never hire anyone. Well, actually I'll say two of them. I'll do the, the quick one first. You never hire anyone without a background check. Yeah. <laughs> And in my opinion, one of the things you check is civil court, which some background check companies will say, well, you can't make a hiring decision on that. Well, maybe you can't legally, but yeah. uh, if they're suing their neighbor or their past employer or vice versa, mm -hmm. wouldn't you like to know that before mm -hmm. you hire this person? Mm -hmm. The person I hired that cost, cost $1.5 million, if I had just done a background check on him, I would have found he was had three or four lawsuits against him for incompetence. Yeah. Um, anyway, Yeah. so... But the main thing I want to point out as far as the, the million dollar savings here, you never hire anyone unless you give them a test drive. Interesting. And, and what does okay. that look like? I mean, it, it, how, so, how do you do that effectively? It can vary. It can okay. vary. I have people that do something for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. So if you, have a, a, if you have a technical person, you give them real technical work. If you have a marketing person, they help you write some marketing copy. Or you know, if you have a salesperson, you, you run them through actually selling. You know, and you could do a short one initially and then do an extended one. So one of my great clients who, who's a great, great company is WCA Technology in, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter Fiddler, who runs that company, I mean, they've been around 30 plus years. They do a great job. Uh, what they have developed is they'll go through the interview process and then literally they will pay a candidate as a contractor to come in and work a full day. Yeah, And in that full day, they throw real tickets at them and they work with them. And the, and the person, it's, it's a wonderful thing for the candidate. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind this qualification thing, we get caught up as leaders that, you know, we don't want to get the wrong person on our team. Well, we're really doing someone a disservice if we hire them and then let them go a month or three months later. Yeah. Because they weren't a fit and we didn't do the right qualification job. The interesting thing there too, is it, it kind of, it gives the candidate like a real sense of what it's like to work here and lets them filter out if they need to. <laughs> Cause I think a lot of exactly. times people end up overselling or kind of so focused on just trying to get the job and, you know, ace the interview and, and get the offer letter and then they take it and then they get there and they realize they made a huge mistake, you know, that they, right. that this is, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, employer can be like, oh, sorry, you know, we're just going to hire somebody else. Whereas an employee, it's like, like, what do you do? You go back to your old job with your tail between your legs or are you back out on the street? I mean, like it's, it's much more a bad hire, I think is much more impactful on the, the employee, on the candidate than it is on the company. Oh, I agree. So, so the test drive is really important. I mean, it's important because they're going to do real work. It's important because they're interacting with your team. And some of them at my clients will throw a few tickets or throw a few scenarios at the person that are pretty much impossible, if not yeah. totally impossible. Yeah. See how they handle an impossible thing. Put them on a phone with a client who's going to scream at them and cuss at them when they didn't do anything wrong. Yep. You know, how do they handle that? Yeah. And I have come to believe that in every single role, the test drive is the absolute most important criteria of the the decision making process. Yeah, yeah, it's similar. Like I've heard people say that they use a kind of a, a, a unselling phase of the interview process, or you know, once they've decided they want to hire somebody, that they they actually take some time to try to un convince the person not to take the job. It's kind of a well, you know, they, we work really long hours, or it can be you know, the end of the month can be really brutal here. Like they they make a point of making sure they're covering all the you know, all the hard parts and all the, the warts of, of the role in the company, so be, because that if, if the person still takes the job, it's kind of a, a you know, caveat emptor, you know, that the buyer beware, you know, they, they, we told them about this stuff, <laughs> so they can't complain about it if, <laughs> if we get into that situation. Well, I think you're, I think you're right, but my, my advice would be that you don't save that till the end. Yeah. You actually front load that and oh, do that more in the beginning. And the reason is that 
if you were to guess, Bruce, what what do you think I would say is the most important objective when you're hiring? The most important objective when you're hiring, not hiring the wrong wrong people. <laughs> That's a good it's, one. It's, it's That's a, a, good one, false, but... a false positive, I think, is much worse than a false negative. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's a good one, yeah. but it's not my number one. Okay. What's your number one? My number one is your your number one objective is to protect your time. Uh, okay. Yep. So so that's why I would front load the negatives. Because you're going to filter I, out. Basically, you, you want to filter out people quickly. Exactly. Yeah. So so it doesn't mean I'm going to handle, I'm, not, I'm like going to be a total downer on the first call. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to verbally abuse them that, on the on right. the screener. <laughs> yeah. So it's like in my first phone interview, and I, I, you know, I teach how to re- read a resume. I teach uh-huh. how to look, you know, look up somebody online, what to look for. I teach uh, in the phone interview. I have certain questions that for me are mandatory. So I'm going to ask. Yeah, give me one. You know, what's your commute? That's pretty easy. I'm right. going to ask, what are your compensation requirements? You know, legally in most states, we can't ask, what do you make? Yeah. But yeah. I, I do need to know what are your compensation requirements? If they want to make 120,000 and my budget is 60, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. It's just not going to work. Yeah. And, and I'm also going to ask, and some of these questions are uncomfortable. I'm going to ask, are you interviewing with other companies and at what stage are you with them? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't want to ask that. Uh, but I had a client, oh, I don't know, a year or two ago, and they were trying to hire an admin role. And this, this gal looked really good on paper. They talked to her and they're like, oh, she's incredible. They asked the question. She said, well, actually, I'm supposed to get an offer today and I'm supposed to respond in two days. And they said, well, come on in. We'd love to talk to you if you're willing to consider it. She said, well, I'll, I'll consider you, but I, I do have to respond to this other offer in two yeah. days. Well, they couldn't move that fast. Yeah. yeah. And so just but being realistic. She was a superstar and she yeah. proved it. Yeah. Yeah. And she proved it by responding in two days. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know, having integrity. Yeah. So I think you, you got to watch the time. And so you got to balance uh, like your negatives that you're bringing up. In the phone screen, I want to ask some tough questions, but I want to connect. And I want to confirm some things. I may bring up a few of those negatives, maybe not all of them, mm-hmm. but I may bring up a few just like, you know, are you aware of this? Is this going to be a problem? Uh, you sound like you're really a good match. You know, I'm going to sell them a little bit if mm-hmm. I'm sincerely, mm-hmm. but I'm going to end it if, you know, if it's not a match. Yeah. I think being realistic gotta, about that is, is the important part. Yeah. You got to, you got to say, you got to protect your time. Yeah. None of us have enough time. Yeah. So that's the recruiting side. So let's talk about, uh, I've, I found a good candidate. We've gone through the process. I've negotiated the, you know, the employment agreement. I, they've agreed to an offer. They're coming on board. What do I need to do to be successful with folks once, once I've, you know, kind of signed a deal, once I've, I've, I've found someone and they're, we've put together an agreement to have them come on my, into the company on my team. What do I need to focus on then? Isn't it amazing? And I, I suspect you're asking this question because you know so many people do this poorly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've, I know people that, that uh, I've, I've heard stories of people that show up on their first day of work and other people in the company didn't know that they were starting. <laughs> so they don't know, they don't have a computer. They don't have anywhere to sit. It's like, so, oh, that's a great first impression. <laughs> oh, it's, it's funny. I like to tell the story of Dana and Dan. So so Dan gets, uh, goes in, does his interview process. And just like you said, he gets his offer. And a couple of days later in the mail, he gets a package. that's a welcome package, welcoming him to the company. Yeah. It's got some brochures on the company. It's got some tchotchkes. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, when we do it, we send out a hundred dollar gift card. Nice. And, uh, we just say, welcome to the team. You know, really glad to have you. By the way, what do you think the purpose of sending a welcome kit is? What's the primary objective? So you want a good reputation with the family. That's my guess. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's not yeah. to sell a candidate. Yeah. We already closed the candidate. Yeah, exactly. We want to sell the people who live with the candidate to reinforce the decision because this is a big decision. Yeah. It's going to impact anyway, everyone. So Dan, yeah. So, yeah. so Dan gets the welcome kit and, you know, he's got some communication and um, about a week before he starts, uh, he gets some of his, uh, a few of his new business cards in the mail saying, hey, we got your business cards. Looking forward to it. A couple of days before he starts, he gets photos emailed to him. Hey, your cubicle's all set up. Computer's ready to go. Boom. We're ready for you. Dan shows up his first day. The receptionist says, hey, Dan, it's good to see you again. Come on in. And by the way, he had already been invited to come in and fill out all the HR paperwork in advance, mm-hmm. which yeah. he did. Yeah. And uh, the hiring manager is ready for him immediately, gives him a quick tour to remind him, says, hey, here's your cubicle. We're all set to go. Brings him into the office, says, okay, 
here's your onboarding plan. We got an onboarding plan for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it is, you can see it's documented. Let's walk through today and uh, we can adjust it as we go to meet your needs. Really excited to have you here. I've got this schedule for you. Anything I'm missing, anything you want to change, any other thoughts you've had? Totally prepared, ready to go. Dan goes through the day, goes home at the end of the day, walks through the door. What question do they ask him? I'm not sure. How did it go? What That's was right. Day? How yeah. did it go? Yeah. And Dan says, it went incredible. Yeah. I don't know. I should have gone to work for these people five years ago. <laughs> I'm going to call Susie and, and Sam yeah. back at my old place, tell them to apply. Yeah. This place is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And then I tell the story of Dana. So Dana gets her job offer and uh, she goes in. And, and uh, here's nothing from the company for two weeks, goes in and goes up to the receptionist, say, hi, I'm Dana. I'm supposed to here to see my boss uh, starting. And the receptionist says, Dana who? Mm -hmm. And calls back and then says, oh, I'm sorry. He's busy. Uh, but he said, that, fill out this HR paperwork. You can sit up right over there in the lobby and fill that out. And he'll be down in about 20 minutes. 35 minutes goes by and the boss comes down and says, sorry, I was really busy. Had to take care of this. Look, uh, here, why don't you look at these company brochures? You can sit in the conference room, moves her to the conference room. She sits there for about 15, 20 minutes. Then he shows up again. Then he walks over to her cubicle, says, sorry, um, you know, we, we got your we got your computer kind of set up. Uh, I think there's a broken key on the keyboard, but we'll get you another keyboard and we need to get you a chair, but it'll work out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no chair. So it brings her into the off his office and says, hey, uh, we're really glad to have you on the team. Uh, what questions do you have for me? Uh, and that's it, man. Yeah. That's the whole where, day. Where do you want to work? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So she goes home at the end of the day. She gets the question. How did it go? But she has a really different answer. She says, I think I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I found a job, a short-term job instead of a career. I think I got to keep looking. These guys are not what, what they told me they were going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's too bad. I mean, I think there's, and, and, and I'm going to pull two things out of that. I mean, one is the, you know, have a plan, like have a process, you know, make sure that you've got, uh, you know, obviously like equipment and infrastructure and they've got the passwords they need and their accounts are set up and they have an email, like all that kind of kind of productivity, logistical stuff. But I think the other thing that that you kind of alluded to or you, you brought into that example was this idea of how, what else, what is the challenge or the stress that an, a new employee is going to be going through and how can we help how can we help with that? So the whole idea of, you know, sending a package to the house, you know, giving a gift card to take the family out to dinner so that, you know, you can kind of celebrate any just thinking through, well, what is the employee going through in part of as part of this transition and taking a new job is a huge stressor. How can I make this easier for them? In fact, how can I delight them by doing things, you know, very unexpected to make me an exceptional employer? I think that that's a there's a huge opportunity there. Well, that's right. I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, the studies, Bruce, I'm sure that people, the primary reason people leave their jobs is because they don't like their boss or yeah. their coworkers. Yeah. And so this is all about relationships. And particularly in this connected economy, this, this online social network type of thing, we don't want to go out and create a bad relationship yeah. and have them promote maybe some mistakes we made and, you know, talk bad about us. There's too much competition out there. Yeah. So well, and even nowadays, when it does, go ahead. Well, well, nowadays with like things like Glassdoor and stuff like that, I mean, you, you can create a, a reputational nightmare for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we really want, even when it doesn't work out, we want to make certain that we set expectations really clear yeah. for how it's supposed to work. When it's not working out, we want to communicate that, give people an opportunity to work it out, have a good performance improvement process in place that can be followed. And when it's not working out, we're respectful, we're empathetic, and uh, we're wishing them the best and we're parting company. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what happened, that's the other thing. People don't like to pull the trigger and fire people. And, and uh, so talk to me about that. I, I, I would agree. What's your kind of assessment of why that's difficult? What gets in people's ways? How they overcome that? Well, it's conflict. Yeah. And it's personal. Yeah. No matter what way you handle it. And usually the person, the, the leader mm -hmm. knows that to a certain extent, they messed up. Yeah. It's an admission of failure. Yeah. And, mm. and, and they know it, it hurts this person. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, whether you're firing somebody who's embezzling from you or someone who's just a nice person and they're messing up and they can't get their act together yeah. as far as, as well as what you need yeah. might be fine somewhere else. It's, it's still, it's no fun. I I've seen 
several surveys where that was the number one thing leaders hated the most was firing someone. Yeah. But you got to, the faster you do it, the better it is. Yeah, well, so, so speed, you know, kind of not letting it linger. Any other suggestions or tips that you, you've given leaders in terms of, you know, how to do this in, in a, an appropriate, respectful, empathetic, but effective way? Well, so the, the best way to do it is that you have good communication. Mm-hmm. The, one of the big failures of leaders is they're so busy, they don't communicate enough. And so if you're communicating with the person, so if I have an employee strategic plan, it's very clear what they're supposed to be doing. If I'm meeting with them every week to review their goals and giving them feedback, and early on, I might be reviewing their expectations with them every week where, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not only saying here, let me give you feedback on how well you're meeting my expectations, but I'm asking, how am I doing as far as meeting your expectations? Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen pretty quickly is when they're not, when they're not working out, it's going to be clear. And you're going to have that dialogue and you're going to say, okay, well, here's what we need to do to get this on track. This is important for you to, you know, meet the needs of this role. And then you're going to move to a write-up and then you're going to move to a performance improvement plan. The performance improvement plan might be 90 days, but if they're not working out in two weeks into it, then you you need to cut it short. Yeah. But as long as you have that communication, it's a much better process. Because it's clear you're giving them every opportunity you can yeah. to succeed. Yeah, and preparing them. I mean, it's not a it's not a big surprise. It's they they there's been incremental discussion and, and kind of movement of uh, movement of the discussion through through that process. So let's talk about if if you've got a rock star, if you've got someone who is is, is proven to be an amazing hire, they're performing exceptionally. You know, you see huge potential. They're excited. Like, what do I do to make sure that I'm uh, retaining them, engaging them. What are some things you can do with your with your really kind of star talent that's really going to boost that relationship, boost the performance that you're getting? Well, I mean, we do talent assessments to look at behaviors and driving forces or motivators and then also soft skills. So we, we understand what motivates a person, how to engage them and what their natural behaviors are that they like to do. I think you did it with us years ago. Yeah. Um, the... That's a that's a complex question. So if I were to narrow it down, usually superstars um, find out the direction they want to go and then support them in that direction. That's where, once again, the employee strategic plan is critical yeah. because they're writing it, they're driving it, and um, they often want to learn more skills. They want to grow. They want to get more authority. Um, if they're If they're a superstar talent that actually could move on, you know, you need to think of ways to pay them based on performance. Yeah. And so they have kind of unlimited pay, unlimited opportunity. Did you ever see Customers for Life, a book by Carl Sewell, S-E-W-E-L-L? No, I didn't. Tell me about it. It was written a long time ago. And then he did an update. I mean, literally like 30 years ago. And he did an update like in 2012 or 2014. But he tells a story that I'll never forget. Yeah, he took over his dad's Cadillac dealership. And when he did, the service department was losing money. He didn't know how to run a service department. So he called in the service manager and he said, look, he said, I don't know how to do this. If you turn around the service department, I'll give you 10% of the profit from the service department every year in addition to your salary. Service manager says, okay. So with that incentive, all of a sudden things changed and the service manager started making some money and then a lot of money. And it got to be about the eighth year this program was in place. And every year Carl would do a, a salary review. Mm-hmm. compensation review. And it, it really started to bug the service manager, like year six, year seven, year eight. So I think it was the eighth year, if I'm remembering correctly, they go through their compensation review meeting. Carl says, okay, everything sounds good. Let's go. And the service manager says, I'm sorry, Carl. I just got to ask, when are you going to change my comp plan? And Carl looks at him kind of funny. He goes, well, why? What are you talking about? He goes, Carl, you and I both know, you know, here in Dallas, you can get uh, service managers for a fraction of what you're paying me with this incentive Mm -hmm. and Carl bursts out laughing and he goes, are you kidding me? He said, when you took that over, uh, it was losing money. And now I get 90 cents out of every dollar that you create. (laughs) I'll do that deal all day long. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And, and yet, and yet how many Bruce think about it? How many leaders do you know, including ourselves? I mean, I actually, I can say hundred percent confidence. I, I do that. Yeah. But how many leaders do we know that they'd say, oh, no, that person can't make more than, you know, X? Yeah. 
Yeah. That just wouldn't be right. Well, it's it's kind of yeah, it's it's limited thinking, kind of micro, you know, micro thinking around around those issues. But yeah, I like that idea that you know, essentially, in in funny ways, they're becoming business partners. I mean, like you, you need to figure out how are you going to partner with them, and not only on your the company's success, but on their success. Like how how do you become an advocate and a and a resource for them in terms of them being more successful? I like that. Yeah, exactly. And also notice you don't have the complication of equity. Yeah. You know that if if he if the guy or the woman leaves at some point, you yeah. have to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. It's, it's it's all still there. So you give them this huge opportunity, and um, a lot of people will rise to that. They'll love that. As a matter of fact, when I was doing that Microsoft Dynamics thing, mm -hmm. there was a partner down in uh, Atlanta, and they they did this type of program for their salespeople. You know where they they would pay him. They had a young guy who in his mid twenties who made four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I said, so how do you feel about it? He shrugged his shoulders. He said, I thought it was great. Because <laughs> <laughs> exactly. he made the so company I, four I, million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they they structured it. They made their profit. They, they didn't yeah. care. I said, how's he going to do this year? He said, well, he'll probably make a little over a hundred. But you know, yeah. but yeah. you know, I don't care. I hope he does it again. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, good, David. This has been a pleasure. Um, if people want to find out more about you, about Manage to Win, what's the best way to get that information? I just go to our website, uh, Manage to Win, uh, Manage, the number two win dot com. Uh, we've got, you know, all the information there on our, our different services, our, our blog, our podcast. Uh, by the way, I was talking with somebody this week yeah. and they said, oh, yeah, I was listening to your podcast. It had that guy who does uh, the stuff with the cannabis company or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yes, good, good. I said, yeah, that was a good conversation. You should check out more of his stuff. But yeah, anyway. no, so for, for people listening here, I was on David's podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe not even, maybe two weeks ago, and we talked I, we talk, uh, about my other podcast, Thinking Outside the Bud, which I've mentioned a couple of times here. But uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, how, how it affects in just employment in general is, is certainly an interesting topic, but the cannabis industry is, is fascinating in terms of its dynamics. Uh, but just all encourage people to go over and, and listen to the listen to manage to win podcast and obviously check out our episode uh we had a good conversation but this was fun thank you so much for reciprocating and and being here on this one i really appreciate it i think we, we covered a lot of great ground oh thanks so much i really appreciate being here it was great thanks david you've been listening to scaling up services with business coach bruce eckfeld to find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.